So it's time to see what the word has to say to us today. And by the way, you guys look good. You really do. And whatever it is that you're going through, don't let the enemy steal your joy. Because when you come in here and you've taken some hits throughout the week and you sit there silently, you're giving the enemy victory over your lives. But when you come in here and you sing anyhow and you praise anyhow and you thank God anyhow, you confuse the enemy because the last time you went through that thing, you were silent, but this time you're not. Because we come here to worship so that we can support people. See the connection? Our worship leads to community engagement. Not special events, but ministry. Ministry is not seven to eight. Ministry is 24-7. Imagine if God only gave us breath for portions of the day. See the logic? He ministers to us 24-7, seven days a week, 365 and he's done that every single year of all of our lives. Ministry beats event planning. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up Brother Bernard, Joseph. He's one of us, and we expect that he's going to be fourth or fifth from the right-hand side of this pew in his seat over the next several weeks. We pray, Lord, that while he is now in surgery, that you would touch his body. Because he's getting operated on the Sabbath, we believe that his vital signs will be better because this is his day of rest. We pray for his wife. She's been there. She's been supporting him. She loves him. And we ask, Lord, that you would give her the gift today of being able to say that he might have been cut open, but by God's grace, everything went well. I also pray, Lord, for those that are under the sound of my voice, that whatever it is that they are going through, may they, we, us, never forget that your word has promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And so, Lord, now as I open your word one more time, I ask that the message would be simple and clear and plain so that even a child would understand. And by the time we do the benediction, because this is not a hospital, we already cleared that up the other day, our church is not a hospital, but it is a base where we come as soldiers to refuel and get more ammunition to go out there and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that this message would give us hope, hope for ourselves, hope for our families, and hope for our communities, because we ask these things in the name of Jesus, let everyone say, Amen. I'm going to talk a little bit to start about grass again. Are you tired of hearing about grass, Sister Kim and Everald, are you tired of hearing about that? Now, I've hit all four of your family members targeting you guys today at church. Pray for me that I'll target a different family. But if I wake up next Sabbath and I'm alive and well, I'll be hitting you guys again. I like you guys. But we're talking about grass yet again. Anybody like grass in the room? Sorry, let me clarify. Sodded grass. Sodded grass. Wow, did the pastor just say that? Yes, he did. I saw some people's eyes open. Good, you're awake now. I have your attention. I like grass, sodded grass. 
Uh, and the reason why I like grass is, is there's nothing better than when you pull up to anywhere and the grass is green. Nothing. There's nothing that beats it. Even when you take a drive through rolling hills, isn't it nice to just see the trees and the grass and it's just well manicured? I like that look. I'm not saying I always get it right, um, but I like that look. But this weather throughout the summer has been deceptive. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but it has rained on days, like on a Friday, so that you can't always get to cut your lawn in time for Sabbath. Are you with me so far? I'm sorry, was I the only person, or were you mowing your lawn before you came to church? Tell the truth so that you don't lose your blessing. So as a result of... This grass thing, it's a love-hate relationship that we have with one another. There have been times throughout the years where there have been weeds that have sprouted up. And I'm Canadian, proud to be Canadian. Any Canadians in the room? Let the church say amen. Oh, we need more Canadians in our, in our church. And the only reason why I'm saying that is because somebody said, hey, amen. Not hey, amen, amen. Let the church say amen. So what happens is, is that there are times when if you don't cut regularly and manicure, and I know some of you have your big knives where you go outside and you dig and you twist and you pull out. I ain't doing all of that, I promise you. But I've got friends that know a lot about lawn care, and what they've told me is, is that when you have weeds, sure, the fastest way is to put fertilizer on it, the fastest way is to cut it with uh, whatever, whether it's a knife or a weed um, puller. But the other way that you can do it is by throwing a whole bunch of seeds in that spot with topsoil, right, Everell? And as it grows, what does it do? It chokes out the weeds. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I'm, I'm down somebody's lane. I can see that some of you all like weed stuff. The reality is, is that sometimes where we find weeds, we have to scatter seeds. And I'm not talking about prosperity stuff today because you want to figure out how you can get rid of your financial stuff. I'm not here to talk about money today. It will happen in the future. But I'm here to talk about the idea of why it is that we scatter seeds, especially in places where there may be other things that are growing up that may choke out or completely deplete your lawn if you don't replace it with the right type of seeds. But if you like green grass, you also know this, that not all seeds are created equal. Let the church say amen. And I had to learn the hard way because I went to the nursery once, never again to that nursery. I won't tell you where it's located. But I went there and they had this see-through bag of seeds, half price and then 25% off of that. Can I get a witness? <laughs> half price and 25 cents. 25% off of that. So I took those seeds and I scattered it on my lawn and found that there were more weeds than seeds. <laughs> Sister Blackwood, you have a friend closer up front. Sister Charmin has become the new you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, I hear her. I hear her. That's why I'm not talking this week. Okay, no problem. But what I discovered is that by, uh, by trying to save here, it cost me more because even though the seed looked the same, when I scattered it, there were more weeds in those seeds than just pure seeds. Talk to me, somebody. I think you know where I'm going. Thank you. This is how I know church has been good today. Whenever you get a note that has nothing to do with church, church is on fire. Honda SUV CX FD 284, your car is still running. 
And that car might be running because once they turn it off, they can't start it again. Let the church say amen. So if that's you, just leave it. <laughs> but, Sister Viv, as you go, That's why I like to know people's names. So apparently she doesn't turn off her car when she comes to church. As we're talking about seeds. So now that I've discovered that those seeds that are 50% less and 25% off of the 50%, they are not the greatest of seeds, I've had to put a little bit more money into the seeds. And the seeds that I'm now buying are the ones that are coated and shaded so you know I know what I'm talking about, right, Charmaine? Because that seeded seed is good because even when the sun comes out, if the tree is blocking the grass, it doesn't wither and fade away because it's a super kind of seed. Are you with me so far? Because really what I'm saying as I now make this jump into the passage is that God is calling us to be super seeds. Not 50% seeds and then 25% off of that. He's asking us to be the type of seed where no matter where you throw that seed, it's guaranteed to grow. So if you check out early, this is the essence of holiness. God is calling us to be holy, not because he wants us to be watchdogs over other people who may be struggling with things that we've been delivered from because we're too old from doing those things anymore. God wants us to be super seed so that we can show forth his praises by the type of topsoil we become as a community. See, here he goes again talking about community because what your pastor is actually saying is sometimes I wish we didn't talk about the me so much. Me and my relationship with God and how I am doing. And while that is important, it's better when we start talking about how are we doing as a community because the better we are is the more God will use us collectively as a congregation. And so in 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter begins by talking about this scattering. And they're not just scattered in any old place. They are scattered in the provinces of Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia. And really this is the area that we now call Turkey. Now this has great significance because you know that there has always been a historical jostling that happens between Muslims and Christians because of this birthright thing. Come on, talk to me. I'm teaching you a little something, something today. But in this first century, post-crucifixion, post-death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you find that there are now some Jewish Christians that are displaced. They have been moved and scattered like seeds in the area of Turkey. Now let me tell you what the irony is, because what you want to know right away, just in case you check out, is how is Turkey doing with Christians right now? And the reality is there is 99% Muslim in Turkey, which means what God had in mind for this region of the world, they may not be successful there because they didn't understand holiness. And then maybe I should ask the question, because we all live at different places. Is the crime rate down where we live? Is alcoholism down? Domestic violence, shooting, kids graduating from high school, is that going up? The question is, if we have been called to be a super seed, how's the sod in our neighborhoods? 
And I promise you, I'm not judging anybody, right? I'm not judging anybody because the truth is some neighborhoods have different issues, right? So the ones that you think that I've just mentioned, you might think those are the only ones. But what about those of you that might live in some of the uppity neighborhoods? How's the mental health over there? Are the children putting down the psychiatric drugs that their parents are taking and mixing it with alcohol? How are they doing in your neighborhood? Because we have to move the principle of what I'm talking about and put it into the neighborhood that you are living. And once you have done so, you will have to determine, am I a discounted seed or am I a super seed? So Peter begins to talk to these individuals that are scattered. And we don't like to be scattered, right? Remember, we're still talking about community. We don't like to be scattered. We don't like change. We don't like to be put into uncomfortable situations because Whenever that happens, we get a little bit annoyed with God because we would love to be able to tell God what to do, but you're not smart enough. You're not wise enough. You're not sovereign enough. You haven't been around long enough to even begin to understand how God moves and why he does what he is doing. But Peter says in verse 2, that they have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the th- um, sanctifying work of the Spirit. And really when he says the sanctifying work of the Spirit, what he's saying is that as we allow the Spirit to cut away the fat from us, then we become lean, mean fighting machines for God. That's okay. I'm going to get to you slowly but surely. And he also then says to be obedient. Oh, I know we don't even like those words when people use the word obedient uh, because everybody is smart and everybody is educated. We don't like that word because obedience sounds a little bit domineering and controlling. And here's the new word for all things narcissistic. But here in verse 2, Peter says that through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. So you already know that in order for you to submit to the Spirit of God, you have to be covered by the blood of Jesus. See, it's in the Bible. We've been in church for a long time, and now because it's the 23rd year of the 21st century, whatever it is, we're now displacing. Once upon a time, we talked all about Jesus. Now everybody's talking about the Spirit. But Peter is saying it's both sprinkling of the blood of Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, I'm just walking you through, and then there are a couple of things that I want to say. He then says, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth. Now this to me sounds odd, because didn't Peter say in the first couple of verses that they have been scattered. So are you saying then that sometimes when we are scattered and displaced and not where we want to be, that's God demonstrating his mercy towards us? The answer is yes. See, I knew you'd be quiet. The amens, they were coming hot during the sod. But we're starting to get quiet now. Because what Pastor Andre is saying is, is that it is by the mercy of God that he scatters us 
all over the various regions because he wants to give us new birth. See, it's in the text. New birth. In other words, when a seed is in a bag, it's of no use. Come on, talk to me somebody today. You won't know the power of the super seed until it is planted in the ground. And can I just say this? <laughs> the church is a bag. It's not the ground. I grew up in a very big church. Uh, when I said Shireen, she's fourth from the front to the right-hand side. Second from there, sitting beside her husband, tapping him because she's saying, I knew him when he was just a little boy. And look how in Talawa or something like that. I don't know. I'm not Jamaican. Ugh. But I grew up in a, in a big church. We grew up in a, in a big church with lots of people. But as big as we were in those days, and I don't know what it is now, we understood that church was not just about weekly attendance. Church was about cutting the bag open and allowing the seeds to fall around in the neighborhood. Because here's the thing. What sense does it make to be in the bag if you never touch ground? And that's why, Sister Blackwood, the more I pastor, and I'm 18 years in, here's one of the things that I'm no longer hearing um, with intentionality. Uh, when I was uh, early in ministry and people would complain about the order of service or the length of scripture or how people looked when they come behind the sacred desk. I used to scramble because you've got to respond because whatever people are talking about, the things that impact um, what we do in the church, those are the major things. But the longer I pastor, I realize that you may never be able to make God's people happy. You can lengthen praise time, shorten it, somebody's always going to complain. You can preach softly or loudly, somebody's going to complain. Wearing a tie, don't wear a tie, somebody's going to complain. So guess what? I'm no longer interested in what seeds have to say that are in the bag. I want to talk to some real people that want to get out into the neighborhood and drop to the ground and through our worship make a difference there. I don't want anybody coming to my office to gossip about somebody else because the truth is what you may have learned to, to do is talk about their story while hiding yours. But I thought he was smiling during worship. He's all smiles now. God does not want seeds to stay in the bag. He wants them to be dropped in the community as a super seed to make a difference out there. New birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that cannot perish spoil or fade do you see this Peter in verse 4 now says that having been scattered because God wants you to become the hope to the community no matter what happens to you while you are scattered you will never perish spoil or fade as long as you remain in the ground. Ah, okay, so back to the seeds. What are you talking about, Pastor Andre? What I'm saying to those of us that have lawn at home, whether it's brown or it's super green, green haven't you noticed that no matter how many times you mow the lawn, as sharp as the blade may be, even though you get cut and sliced and diced, don't you grow again after a while as long as you are in the ground? Not bag Christians, 
but soil Christians. He then says that there is an inheritance for those who stay the course that is kept in heaven. I'm trying to teach us today because it doesn't make sense to be in the soil if you're not focused on the sun. Uh, see, I'm talking about grass, but I'm not talking about grass. I'm talking about us because the truth is where there is no sunlight, everything dies. Is that how it works, scientists? So you do need to have sun. Therefore, while scattered and planted in the ground, the thing that gives the grass life is its ability, despite how many times you mow it down, it still looks up to get its source of hope and sonship from above. And this is important, right? <laughs> Talking about the church community today. Because at times... We chip out of church ministry early because we're focused on the wrong things. Everything bothers some of us. People bother us. Where we sit bothers us. Volume bothers us. Colors bother us. Even some people who breathe heavy because they have a sleeping machine, that bothers us. Let the church say amen. I'm liberating some of you who have sleep apnea today. Let the church say amen. It's quiet in here. Lots of machines. Let me keep pushing forward. The ability to look forward to where you are going will determine your experience while scattered. In verse 5, he then says, having told us that there's an inheritance kept for you who through faith are shielded until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be, be revealed in the last time. Now, by the way, Adventist, I'm, I'm here now because sometimes you're like, oh, his pastor, Adventist, ha, ha, ha. last time. Peter says here in verse 5 that regardless of what you are going through while scattered, this too will come to pass, which means, therefore, that we're not in the ground for eternity. We're here until God comes to reap us. But did you notice the reaping is not only happening in the church even though that's where the conversation is happening. The reaping happens when we are in the world, but not of the world. Oh, if I don't do this, I would be reckless. And you all can be upset with me if you want to. I'm good with it. It's hard for me to understand if we are 100% sold out for Jesus. You heard the disclaimer, 100%, forget about 90, 80%, sold out for Jesus. How can we continue to go to Caravana programs? Okay, fine, you didn't go to Caravana, but I know there's somebody at home that's watching me that's concerned with catching COVID. I'm positive if, uh, if I ask some of my friends that work in the industry, I might even see you at Beyonce's concert. Let the church not say amen. And for some of us, we think that because we are there and maybe other people are drinking and other people are smoking and you are not, but if you're dressed like the world, there... Come on, don't get quiet on me now. 
You can't expect your pastor to be quiet about these things. And yes, once upon a time, I would have been where you are, but I'm older now and I'm more grown up now and I'm not going to not talk about it just because you might be offended about it. You can't be in the world and say you're a part of the church because people can't make the distinction. Because let me tell you what's beginning to happen. So let's just put aside the spiritual aspect. You get that. I know you get that, regardless of whatever you choose to do. You get that. But are you not beginning to see that as you are going out into these spaces, remember you have kids, whether you're married or you're not. Your children are now beginning to watch you worshiping on Sabbath this sovereign God and dropping it like it's hot by Sabbath evening. And then you're going to be upset with them the following Sabbath when they don't want to come to church. Now, I'm not trying to trample on anybody's joy. You have the capacity to choose to do whatever you want to do, but you can't expect that the word of God is going to placate to how you choose to live your life right now. You know, one day, <laughs> I remember I've been pastoring a long time, so one day has come many times. I'll never forget, I was just driving past somewhere, and I know you want to smile already, you're like, mm-hmm, pastor, you're driving past, tell us now, finish the story, why, oh, you're driving past. I was driving past the place. <laughs> and as I'm driving past this place, I see somebody that I know who they are. They're a part of the church body. Now, you know the irony behind this thing, Elder Joan, is that when you see this person on Sabbath morning, as the Caribbean, um, Caribbean people would say, they are Chris like a crackers. You've heard that one before, right? And if you haven't heard of that one, it's not your island, so don't worry about it. Everything is long. You can hardly even see their hands because the sleeves are long. The dress is long. The, 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 the toe is so covered over you can't even see the foot. Church. And as I'm driving past and I see this person out somewhere where I can't even say, I'm like, have thine own way, Lord. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? We're smiling because there's a level of uncomfortability. And my responsibility is not to be a household name, even if I'm spoken of, whether highly or lowly. My responsibility is to remind us that God calls us to be holy. When we go around places, the lives we live should be compelling. See, I could have said judgmental, but compelling to the point where when we show up, wherever that is, people should look at us and say, even though they don't look like this, they look like they are at peace. And I know that it sounds difficult because you think I'm targeting women. I'm not targeting women because I have been in other places and seen individuals posing 
with bottles in their hand, and it's not Aquafina water. And by the way, once upon a time, that used to be your pastor. See, I'm not trying to jump out like I don't understand the temptation of the world. I get the draw of it. And church folk, let me just say this. The world is far more supportive of broken people than we are of the church. Come on, talk to me. Don't get quiet now. This is in the word of God. Because how do we expect God to shield us and cover us with his power when we keep walking through the covering and daring him to allow us to experience what sin its full manifestation feels like? Sometimes we lose our freshness. Come on, talk to me. You know I'm telling you the truth. We lose our glow. Our complexion changes. Because you can't go to work all day long, bleach all night, and don't expect that you're not going to look like you're 100 by the time you turn 40. Did I say bleach? Did I use it out of context? Oh, okay, then fine, then I'll continue. It's like, did I use this thing? Oh, sure, all right, so. <laughs> so let me jump down now, because now I have to talk with us about what holiness looks like according to Peter. He says in verse 13, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you. See, we all have the Bible at home, but how we read it will determine whether or not we catch what the Word of God is saying. He says, Therefore, with minds that are, number one, alert. How do you have an alert mind? By not pouring into the things into your mind that dull it. Therefore, you can only watch so much pornography before you are convicted that that's okay. You can only listen to so much gossip before after a while the gossip no longer phases you and you can sit through any story because it's nothing. You can only skip so much morning worship. And let me say this again, lest you have forgotten. I'm not against devotionals. But I think devotionals have killed our desire to read the Bible. Come on, talk to me. And that's inclusive of some of the devotionals that we buy from our own stores. If you constantly read books about what God has to say through him or her, when will you know what he has to say to you directly? You see, the devotional is put into place to be almost like the fast food of spirituality as you're in a rush to go to work. No, I'm, I'm just, check me on it. What you do now is you fry a piece of plantain, scramble an egg, cut a piece of avocado, half the orange or the grapefruit, sprinkle some brown sugar, right? Some porridge, oatmeal, cut oats, Homily, harmony, ebony and ivory, whatever that thing is called, right? Fosca, right? And you put, your, you put your devotional on slant. 
And while you are cutting and swallowing, you're skimming through it. And by the time you finish the devotional, you belch it off and you're gone to work. But have we really internalized what the Bible has to say? Or are we becoming mere repeaters of other men's thoughts? And I'm not hitting out on anybody today. I promise you, I'm in a great mood. But one of the things you all know about me is I am an advocate for the Bible and the Bible alone. I'm not trying to kill anybody's devotional ministry. If you're writing a book, book, push the book out. But have the courage in your book, if it's Christian content, before you get to the table of content, say this. I'm hoping that while you are reading this book, this book will inspire you to go back to the word because that's what I used to write mine. Fully sober, I've already talked about that. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. See, the end again. It's the second time I'm now mentioning it in the first chapter because how can you be seeds who aren't looking to the end? Okay, um, Shelly Ann Frazier Price, is that her name? Yeah. Right? Fast. I can't even believe she's still running that fast after all of these years. Great shape she's in. Health. Great shape she's in. She's healthy. She has a child, and not everybody's body is going to bounce back like that, right? We know, DNA. But have you ever watched her race? Her head is down, the gun goes off, and by the time she gets to about 70 meters, what is she looking for? Not to see who's close to the end. So how about God's people? When you start checking lanes, I'm sure you saw it on Instagram, there is this big white guy, but fast, running a track meet and beating all kinds of black people in the race. Did you see it on Instagram? Guy was chugging away. You need to go on Instagram. Don't look at the other stuff. Look at the stuff that's a part of my sermon. <laughs> the guy is moving. And I'm telling you, he looks like he's like 260 pounds, not even muscular per se, but he's moving and moving. And when he realizes that he's beaten all of these black people in the same race, because remember, white people can't run. That's what we always say, right? They can't jump and they can't run. It's not true. See how uncomfortable you are? Did he just say that? Yes. So my guy turns his head to the right to the guy that he's about to beat. And what do you think happened to him? Trip and fall and bust his head. <laughs> Sorry, he fell down and hit his head. Not focused on the end, but focused on other seed. They finished. And imagine the guy could have made history because normally people who come first, they have a certain body type, a certain weight type. He could have finished first and shown the entire world that it's possible not to look like Shelly and still win because you're a super seed. So it's the mind, write this down if you're writing, that causes corruption and hampers holiness. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you, uh, sorry, let me read it again. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires 
Notice he didn't say evil. He said desires. He's not writing this letter to the world. He's writing it to the church. What he's saying is that we all have to fight against our natural carnal self in order to finish strong. And let me just help somebody out. Because in the church, we like to target certain sins. But you do know that sins are generational, right? Let me explain. I'm glad you asked. There are things that you won't do at 60 that you used to do at 20. <laughs> Can you imagine at 60? And I know there's some, I, listen, I know people. I know there are some 60-year-olds still going into the club. But how are you going to go into the club and go chapating when it could be your daughter's friends? Sorry, when I said chop, what I meant was, how are you going to try and solicit, engage with somebody that is old enough to be your child? So you're not in the club because you're completely over with it. It's because... It doesn't look cool when you're at the bar having your arthritis medicine before the next reggae set. So you stop doing those things because it's no longer age appropriate. But he says this, that these evil desires, you had them when you were ignorant, meaning you didn't know better. Hey, we've heard this before. When you know better, you're supposed to That's a whole lot of T's on the better. One lady at the back of you like, Brr, better. Got it. I'm clear. And this is why we have to read our Bible. Are you with me so far? We read our Bible because we don't want to guess what is the will of God? We want to know what the will of God is. And this is why, let me step away from the pulpit. I don't want anybody to come to church and tell me, in my opinion, respectfully, I could care less about your opinion. What does the good book have to say? I was watching a video um, just this morning or last night. And I'm weird. I like to watch sermons. Not because I lack sermon material. So if this sounds familiar, it could be or it could not. But let's just say the Lord is using me. <laughs> this pastor was saying that um, a question was posed to T.D. Jakes. And he's one of my favorite preachers. Let me just put it out there. I love the way that he has found a way to do church differently. I'm not saying that I agree with all, but I like the way that he has constructed an organization that is making a difference for what he would like to do in ministry. That's where I'm at. But he was being interviewed, and somebody tried to ask him about LGBTQIA. What is your opinion, Bishop Jakes? Now, you know when they're asking this guy who has millions of followers what they're trying to do to him is to get him to be canceled by culture. Because you're not asking every pastor that. You're not asking the pastor who only has 25 subscribers. You're not even asking Joel Olstein that. You're asking... So let me help you out. Here's what he says. I don't have an opinion on the subject matter, but I know what God says. Yeah. And this is not about bashing people, because remember, the air that we all breathe, regardless of how we live our life, it's God that is sustaining our sin life and our sinless life. But we have to tell people we're not out there spewing 
hate language, we're only telling people what the word of God has to say. See, you got quiet. <laughs> I know that Sister Blackwood loves the Lord, but she was a bad kid. <laughs> Ignorance causes corruption and impacts holiness. If you've been in the church for a long time, you've got to stop saying, I didn't know, nobody told me, when you've got the biggest Bible underhand, open it or get one of your children or grandchildren to set it up as an audio and listen to it. In 2023, you can no longer say, I didn't know. There's too much information out there. Pre-pandemic, if I tell my kids something, they would just say, all right, daddy, I guess you know because you're old. Now, no matter what I tell them, everybody's looking for cell phone. What did you say again, dad? And before I know it, all I can hear is the phone correcting me. <laughs> Ignorance will impact our ability to be holy as God is holy. Verse 15. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. But just at, did somebody say amen? <laughs> oh, well, if that's the case, then I had other notes that I hadn't pulled out of my file. I'm willing. <laughs> But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Well, hold on a second. Is do a noun or is it a verb? Let me help you out. Verb. So holiness is not a person. Well, Yes, Jesus is holy. He's a person. Scratch him for a moment. But holiness is not a person, place, or thing. It's a thing that we do as a result of who we are in Jesus. Ah. So when's the last time our doing impact those who don't no. There has to be a do. And doing is not just coming to church. <laughs> See, I just hurt somebody's feelings. Because you keep thinking that as long as I keep coming and sitting and basking while I'm in the bag... That's right, the cat is now out of the bag. But haven't you asked yourself this question? When Peter says, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy, did you know that that was a quote? Okay, good. So if you know that that's a quote, when Peter is quoting that, did you know that that quote is taken out of Leviticus chapter 11? When Peter now says, be holy, because I am holy, he's referring to the chapter of clean and unclean animals to be touched. But now I'm going to mess you up. Because while Peter may have been referring to this um, chapter in the Pentateuch that dealt with cleanliness based on the uh, dirty animals and insects and so forth that ought not to be touched, 
what he was trying to remind them of as Jewish Christians who are now Christian or Christ followers is in the Old Testament. Everybody agrees don't talk, don't touch, don't drink from, don't eat those things. They're resolved. You don't have to convince anybody. Anybody that's Jewish, you don't have to convince them. Don't touch the lobster. Don't touch the swine. Don't touch the shrimp. Keep helping me out, sister. Um, Because my notes, they're a little bit short there. Any more? I gave you tree pasta. You come up with your one now. You do know that even when Adventists leave the church, there are some things they still won't do. And the truth is they wouldn't even drink except for these concoctions that we drink when we have cold. No, so? Can't go more than so. Can't be more than that. But Peter is no longer talking about these unclean um, bottom feeders. He's now going to make a connection because he doesn't have to convict these Jewish Christians not to do the things in Leviticus chapter 11 because they believe that. So what then is the thing that is deteriorating from um, them from their holiness if not from the things of Leviticus chapter 11? It's the perishable things which is silver and gold. Oh, come on down, pastor. I'm glad you invited me down. Because sometimes we get stuck in talking about things that are then. But Christianity has to constantly make this bridge so that you're able to see the principle, if not the thing. You're not going to go and eat lobster. Or at least not the two that said no. <laughs> but here's what we might do. We might start working on the Sabbath to make more money. Come on, talk to me. Let me tell you what's beginning to happen to us corporately. Because we think that Peter is talking about Leviticus chapter 11, we stop there because we're resolved. There are some things we won't do that are dietary. But what Peter was trying to do is bridge them and say, just as those bottom feeders will deteriorate your health because God said don't touch it, the same thing can be true of when you focus on silver and gold and not the end. Okay, let me bring it a little bit closer. When my generation grew up, AY and Pathfinders and Adventures, not an option. AY and Adventures, if you don't, I'm not singling you out, but just in case you don't know some of this Adventist language, it's the equivalent of Boy and Girl Scouts. We have a whole to-do where millions of dollars is filtered in through our organization all over the world. We grew up knowing how to right turn. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Not one person got up to help me. And whether or not we see 
the same significance of pathfinders and adventurers now. We have not replaced it with a new principle now to engage our children to understand holiness before they get too old. Now let me tell you why, because Peter is a smart guy. Because even though he's talking about Leviticus, you can play, I'm almost done. Even though he's talking about Leviticus chapter 11, he still goes back to talking about Christ the Lamb, verse 19. We've been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Christ is the Lamb. So even though the eating of unclean foods, unacceptable, so too is the pursuit of silver and gold. Now the only thing that trans transcends time and space is the lamb. See, you didn't get it. So now I have to explain it to you. What your pastor is saying is, and I'm not telling you that we no longer need to look at the dietary thing. So don't leave here and say, see, pastor didn't even flat out say it. We're not to eat though. I'm still saying don't eat the stuff in Leviticus 11. Do not. What did pastor say? Do You're on record now because it's on camera. What Pastor Anderson is actually saying is the principle of chapter 11 is different because now the community believes that that is a thing that we ought not to do. Now that we're settled on that, he's now shifting the attention away from unclean and clean to now focusing on what is the new thing to people who are displaced. Economically speaking, they're in bad shape. But the thing that takes us from the Mosaic law to the cross and beyond is the same lamb. The lamb for Moses. The lamb for the prophets. The lamb for the wisdom literature. The lamb for the gospels. And now the lamb for the letters. Jesus is the only thing that is timeless. So why then is Peter talking about holiness? I'm almost there. Because what he was trying to convey to these people who were scattered is that the reason why they ought to be holy is not because of rules and regulations, but because they've been delivered out of Egypt. See the difference? If I have to serve a God only because of rules, it's hard. Don't do this, don't do that. I mean, we're good at that. If we go outside right now and somebody who does not belong to the church is playing basketball, we will look at them and they don't know this is Sabbath. Maybe I should go and talk. You don't talk to anybody out there. Not unless you're planning on telling them hello. We may know differently. We may do differently. But the world, just as God has been working with us, has to come along. Because if we're still getting it right, really? Somebody who walks off the street every single time is going to get it like that when you've been in the church for a hundred years? Finally, Peter, by the time we get to the end of chapter 1, says this. That just as you were chosen to be scattered like seeds, so too was Jesus. Verse 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last time for your sake. Through him... Believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are 
in God. Is chapter 1 now clear to us? I hope so. And so let me end the message this way. There was a kid that went to his mother and asked her for some money. <laughs> In the video as I'm watching this kid, he is begging. And you know how kids know how to beg. They don't even beg standing up. They come, they lean on the couch, they beg, they pull out their hand like they're back stroking. Lord have mercy, that kid knows how to beg. His mom wanted to give him what he was begging for, but she said to herself, I make it too easy for him. So here's what she said to him. I'm going to give you what you're asking for, but you'll have to find it. So watch what the woman does. And I hope the kids are listening because your parents may do the exact same thing. <laughs> she takes the money and hides it into this young man's deodorant. The video follows him going in the chair, in the cupboards, under the chair, in between the books, everywhere. And this thing is following him for days. <laughs> While he's looking for the inheritance, he's not cleaning himself up. See, you're, you're, you're missing it, so how, now I have to tell you. We don't get the inheritance that has been set up there for us without remaining clean simultaneously. Holiness and the inheritance are one thing, not because it's a rule, but because God delivered us out of bondage. All he had to do was hold afresh. If he had opened the deodorant and rolled it, the money would have popped out. If we would just keep our minds sober, stop pretending to be ignorant, clear our mind, focus on Jesus, he already would be here.
So there's a man in Africa. And you know that soil erosion is as a result of a lack of greenery. You know that, right? So wherever there are no trees, you will find that there is soil erosion. So what happens is, every day he walks through this arid, dry place, and he says to himself, I want to make a difference. I'm tired of coming from where it's green and walking through it, through this place that is dry, I need to make a difference. So for over 40 years, every single time he left where he was, where it was plush, he would take one plant with him. And he would put it into the ground one plant at a time. By the time he retired from his job, there was an entire forest because it started with one plant. Your pastor isn't saying do everything. Your pastor is saying do one thing. I'm the pastor, so that's taken. But you might be somebody who's good at singing to people over the phone. That ministry is still open. You might be somebody that knows how to cook something that nobody else knows how to make it that way without salt. And that person likes that thing, but you're sitting on that recipe. That's one thing. Some of y'all, as I'm looking at you have the, the ability to encourage the heaven out of people. That's another position. What I'm also saying is ministry is not just what's at the back of the church manual. When they wrote that book, they don't know anything about Shiloh. They don't know where you're coming from, the history from Kingston Road to Ephesus, from Scarborough. See, I've been doing my research. They have no idea. But every single person that's here has the capacity and the ability to do one thing. And by the way, constructive con um, criticism is not one of the openings. Because nobody wants to hear from somebody who's not doing anything. But pastor, if you guys would just do it, you know what I do these days? Really, you want to help us? And if the answer is no, then I almost forgot that we had the conversation. Because every idea takes a person to implement. God is not calling you to be in the bag. God is calling you to be scattered and choke the world out and choke the culture out and replace vile behavior with holiness. Because here's what I've discovered through personal experience. The world will embrace you as you're doing whatever with them, but they'll never come to Jesus until you take a stand. God's not calling the church to sit down. This is the easiest part of ministry, sitting. But to go from seated to standing to being to doing that's the work of the Holy Spirit. But if you've been covered by the blood of Jesus, it may be hard, but you can do it. So here's what I'm asking, and I'm not going to take long. Anybody want to plant some seeds with your pastor? Step out of your seat. I want to pray for you. I want to encourage you today. 
Because your ministry, people may never know what you do. Because by the way, you can be doing ministry and nobody knows what you're doing. It doesn't have to be a cha 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 It can be quiet. But at some point, you're going to have to go from bag to scattered. God is not coming back for seed. He's coming back for harvest. Put in your sickle, angel. Come on, Revelation people. He's not coming back for seed. He's coming back for harvest. Where are you? Want to step out of your seat and come? Today is your day. If you commit to God, he will give you the ability. I promise you he will. Even if you're a person who stumbles over your word, oh, I can't because I don't speak. Who cares? It's time. We worship God to support people. Our support of people brings them back to our worship. Do you see? It's simple. That's what we do here at Shiloh. We're not here for pomp and circumstance. We're not here to impress anybody. What we're here to do is raise our hands and say, Lord, use me to make a difference. Not to do everything, but to do something. Oh, and by the way, Savior is off the table because only Jesus has that title. Oh, and by the way, Holy Spirit is off the table because that's a God thing. And oh, by the way, we don't need a quarterback for whatever not because that's the Father's job. Come on, where are you? God will use you in your brokenness. Relationship not working? Who cares? Finances not working? Who cares? You got an illness? Who cares? Even if it's terminal, God will use it until you are no longer. To the top one more time. Create in me. Stand to your feet, please.
me, oh, creating me a clean heart, so I, so that I, in the good times and the bad times, so that I, oh yes, no matter how I'm feeling, so that I may worship in spite of my situation, so that I, oh yes, no matter how I'm feeling, so that I, I will, I will, I will give you all my heart. I will give you all my heart. Last time, just the voices, so that I, so that I. Now that you're at your feet, is there somebody that would like to enter into a relationship by way of the church to Jesus? If you're in the building, just raise your hand. I promise you, God wants to use you, scattered, broken, bruised. He wants to use you because you are living proof that the blood still works. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this letter that was inspired and written by your servant, Peter. That guy blew it completely denied the guy, the God that saved him, warming himself by that fireplace. Instead of speaking up, he denied you not once, but twice, three times. And here we are reading his letter in August of 2023. And so Lord, how much more us? We've done worse than Peter. He cussed, we cuss. He walked with a knife, some of us still walk with knives. He didn't honor relationships and friendships, so do we. <laughs> and yet you used him. You went as far as to say, when you guys are strengthened, uh, bring Peter also. Because Peter, post-conversion, that guy was fearless. But it starts with a, a heart transplant. You can't do this based on just your ability. You have to have a heart for God in order to have a heart for people. And so, Lord, all I'm asking is for those that have come forward, seeds of seeds, I pray that you would use all of them. We're all tired. We've all gone through the funerals. We've all lost loved ones. We've all had medical issues. We've all had relationship issues. We've all had financial issues. We've all been dogged to our faces and to our backs. We're tired, Lord, but we don't want to get tired of serving you because you've brought us out of Egypt. So give us a peace that passes all understanding. Give us the strength to keep moving when we feel like collapsing. Give us a smile when our hearts are broken, Lord, so that we can worship you. All we want to do is worship you. 
And all you're asking us to do is worship you through service. Supporting people wherever they are in their walks of life. Lord, help us to have the kind of heart so that we never give up on people. But we can't unless we're sober-minded. So help us to put down the apple tin. Ray and his nephew and everything else in between. Take that taste out of our mouth that desires that weed. When we hear that secular music, Lord, may it be an abomination to our ears. May we cling to the old rugged cross songs. And then finally, Lord, while we're looking for you to come, show us how to look for the end. Every book has an end. Revelation has an end. The newspaper has an end. Every piece of literature has an end, which means that every writer knows that every good story must come to an end. And that's why we're following you here at Shiloh, because you're the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in this building today. May we not leave here the same, but give us the strength to keep on moving until you can move us up and out of here until the earth is, is made new. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer because I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Let everyone say amen. Stretch across the pews, please. Quickly, just stretch across. Take the person's hand to the right, to the left. If you haven't said hi to them, that's okay. You can say hi now or you can awkwardly hold their hand and not say anything. It's up to you. This year, as we focus on community, we're moving from pieces to peace and all we want to do is connect you to God the church the community and the world and as we come here to worship we want to leave here supporting people wherever they are may the Lord bless you all of you all and keep you and make his face to shine on and towards you and lift up his countenance on you and be gracious unto you. And we leave here now as seeds to be scattered. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say amen, amen and amen.